So we have this wiring that says, run towards what's familiar and run away from what's unfamiliar. But the very good news is you can make anything familiar. familiar. And the most important thing to make familiar is praising yourself. That's, if you could just do that, that in itself would change How so? How your you entire life. How do you praise yourself? Welcome everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. We have Marissa Peer in the house. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks it's for being on here. here. Now you have been uh, named Britain's uh, best therapist by many magazines. You've worked with a lot of superstars, rock stars, celebrities, actors, athletes, Olympians, top of the top, uh, helping them overcome a lot of their challenges and be better performers. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And how long have you been in this field of therapy? Amazingly, uh, over 30 years. Over 30 years? Yeah. Oh, so you must yeah. be like, you started when you were about 10, I 11. I was, yeah, right? an embryo, yeah. Okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and why did you get into this field in the first place? Well, it's very interesting. I used to teach aerobics for Jane Fonda here in really? South Robertson, yeah, many moons ago. A few blocks away. Yeah, yeah. Two, we were looking at it this morning. So I trained to be a child psychologist, and I didn't love that because when you're a child psychologist, you have three patients, mum, dad, child. Mm. And especially the mum, dad are divorced, it's very hard to get to the child because they, they use that child often, or one says no sugar, one says all sugar. I found it very frustrating. And of course the kids that really need help, you, you're not seeing, you're seeing the rich privileged kids who are underperforming because they want mm. to punish one or both parents. So that wasn't really working for me. And I think I was too young anyway to do that, I was only 22. So I left and I came to LA and I ended up teaching aerobics for Jane, which I have to say mm. was way more fun than My being bad. a child psychologist <laughs> in the north of England. But I had, had a psychology background, I've always been fascinated by human behavior, and I noticed in her studio, she'd be the first to admit it, every third woman was bulimic, anorexic, including Jane, who was bulimic for a long time. So they were bulimic, anorexic, exercise, compulsive, or body dysmorphic. They go, look, look at this fat on my wrist. Or, Skin. I yeah, know, so. yeah, but to them it was fat. And I remember thinking, this is just insane. And I lived in West Hollywood, and I had two roommates. One was bulimic, one was anorexic. One would defrost cheesecake and cry hysterically while oh eating gosh. the whole thing. The other would eat frozen grape every 30 minutes. And it's like, oh, this is like mad. But also fascinating. So I found this genius hypnotherapist called Gil Boyne out in Glendale, and I trained with him and thought, sure, this is like amazing. I've got all these people in my class. I've got all these issues. Now I've got this hypnotherapy training, and all I have to do is take all my clients straight out of my classes, which mm. I did with immense success. But what happened is I was so busy, we'll ring up, look, I know you're the weight loss hypnotist, but I've got a fear of bees, and I only want to see you because my neighbor said you're like amazing, or I know you're the bulimic girl, but I've got a fear of lift, and I want to see you. And then I realized it was actually much more interesting. Hmm. And so I continued to do that, and then I was doing it backwards and forwards, London and LA, flying, commuting, and then I worked on several TV shows, wrote some books, and then thought, you know, there's only me doing this, so I should teach other people to do it. And now I teach lots of people right. to do, because now I've created my own method, which mm. is really taking the world by storm. What's it called? It's called Rapid Transformational Therapy. How does it work? Well, it works by, so for instance, if you have migraines or you're obese and you go to a therapist, they want you to talk every week about how, it, what's it like it's being years. obese? Well, yeah. uh, very distressing actually. And what does that feel like? Well, frustrating. It's like you're going to the dentist and can I come in every week and talk about oh the infection gosh. in my gum? The dentist goes, no, get that infection out because it just does ongoing damage. So conventional therapy likes to talk a lot and what i don't like about conventional therapy is they go okay you you have bipolar that's very complex therefore the treatment is going to be very complex and that is mm. not the case we're going to take it in stages yeah. and break and it down and conventional here. medicine yeah. too they treat the symptoms whereas when i work with someone who's believed it can go what happened what happened to you they go well my granddad had sex with me when i was 11 until i was 13 and I got really fat, and I never realized the connection that I kept saying, I wish I could stop him looking at me like that. And the mm. mind goes, that's a command. 
You want your granddad to stop lusting after your body. I'll make your body super unattractive. And you have to unpick that. So we had someone who had yeah. chronic migraines and had tried everything. And she was having injections in her head. And when I asked her, because we do this thing called role, function, purpose. We hypnotize someone. Role, function, function purpose. Function, purpose. And in hypnosis, they go back and we say, be the headache and tell me your role. And amazingly, they do it because they're out of their thinking into the feeling mind. And they'll say things like, oh, well, as long as I have those headaches, I can't disappoint my dad, who always says, why aren't you an overachiever like me? I spent all that money on your education. How can you just be a waitress? But now I've got the headaches because, oh, my poor daughter. She could be an amazing barrister, but lawyer, but symptom, she's got these headaches. She can't control and get over. Yeah, and then, of course, when the, huh. when the symptom has a role, function, purpose, and an intention, it's not going anywhere. So, the, so if someone has headaches, you would walk them through what's the role of that yeah, headache? What's, what's the, the benefit? Yeah, right. what's the payoff? Even with children of five, if I say to a five year old, Maybe I know this is a silly question, but if the headache was your friend, right. what would it be doing? They go, well, when mommy and daddy fight and I've got a headache, they stop fighting. They turn off all the lights and we lie in the dark mm. till it goes away. There's a kid who's had a thought, I've got to stop mommy and daddy fighting. And, and because they're, they're not logical creatures, they're feeling creatures, the feeling mind says an illness will stop your parents fighting. Maybe failing at school will make them see that you're unhappy. Mm. Maybe getting eczema will make your mum spend ages massaging the cream into your skin. And you might feel that you matter to her. Because every time you speak to her, she goes, oh, I'm busy at work. I'm doing my emails. I've got to speak to work. And kids think, I want mummy to notice me. And the mind, which is illogical, goes, can I come up with, well, we can have asthma, eczema, dermatitis, irritable bowel. Obesity, yeah. whatever. And 70% of these issues, although the symptoms are real, you have a real migraine and real flaky skin, the cause of them is completely psychosomatic because the mind's job is to tune into your thoughts and give you what it thinks you want. Mm. And it can only work that out by what you say. When you say, this 405 is killing me, I'm dying under paper, my boss makes me want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. Your mind goes, you better not go back to that place called work. I think I should give you an ulcer or agoraphobia because you keep saying that the commute is killing you, the job is killing you. And we say things like killing it, dying here. You know, one of my clients was telling me that her boss just died. He used to sign off all his emails, busy, 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 I wish I was dead. A joke, and then he got cancer wow. and died in really fast. But his signature was, I wish I was dead. And they'll say, oh, I've Somebody asked me, I want to die. Oh, my boss promoted me, I want to die. I, I'm gonna give I'm gonna kill it. And I we could don't die, yeah. yeah, I could and we don't understand that the brain has no sense of humor and only picks up words and thinks they're real. Yeah, it's a lot of what we were talking about with Dr. Joe Dispenza, you know, he yeah, covers a lot of this stuff. Of course. Wow. Okay. So you started helping people from one phase, which was in losing weight, and yeah. you said, let me understand people, it's much more than just losing weight. Yeah, yeah. And you've been doing this for 30 plus years, yeah. since you were 11. Yeah. Why, did you, why were you so fascinated by human behavior in the first place? Well, I was told I could never have children. I just, when I was 17, I stopped having periods completely, hmm. and all the doctors said, well, you know, you, you have infertility, unexplained, which I thought, that's a good title, isn't it? Unexplained. unexplained. Because explained is your fallopian tubes are blocked or you don't have enough estrogen, but unexplained means everything's working. We have no idea what's going on. And so I decided to just work on myself mm. and I simply wouldn't accept that. And I did get pregnant, but then they said, well, everything's gonna be wrong with this baby and it's gonna have the same issues that you've got. You've got all these different hormonal thyroid issues and and they really freaked me out. And then when she was born, she was perfect. And they said, well, she's gonna be very underweight. Oh she was gosh. seven and a half pounds. And I realized then that I was gonna stop all the medication and, and just come out of that. And then I started working with infertile women. It's so rewarding. He'd come in and go, I can't get pregnant. And they'd always go back to say, what's going on in this scene? <gasps> I'm 
15, I think I wrote, my dad will kill me. Oh my God, my mum will kill herself. You know, we're Muslims and I'm dating this white guy and oh my God, the shame, the terror. And the day they found out they're not pregnant, they go, thank you, Allah, I'm so happy I'm not pregnant. Now the mind is crystal clear, having a baby will kill you and not having a baby is something to celebrate. And when you repeat something that's in mind enough, it just can't unravel that. When right. women say, I've got the curse every month, and oh, I hate this, and I wish I never had them, and then the periods go away, they never kind of look at what's going on there. And so I found infertility really easy to fix. Mm. And then I had people with secondary infertility, which means you had a baby, you got pregnant like a high, high school girl on a date right. immediately, but you've been trying for seven years to get pregnant again. Why does that not happen? Because you go home and say to your husband, imagine if we had a second one, oh, that would kill me. Oh, I'd leave you if we had two keeping us up all night and that, that would bankrupt us. And can you imagine what a night we would like to have wow. another one? The mind goes, don't have another one. And of course you don't mean it. You don't mean it. We go quite cheerfully throw this kid out the window. In the middle of the night, I could just give them away. I remember saying to someone, your, your baby is lovely. She said, come back at 2 a.m. You oh can have gosh. him. It's a joke. Like we say to our kids, you're so lovely, I could eat you. And they think, really? So um, we see all this crazy stuff, which we mind. know is crazy, but the mind right. says, this is literal. This is real, you mean it. When you say, I'm dying under my paperwork, the mind goes, no more paperwork for you. When we say, I'd die if my next relationship ends. If, if I got hurt like this again, it would kill me. The mind goes, you know what, if it would kill you, why don't I just turn you into a complete bitch? You never have another relationship again, and then it can't kill you. Right, and then and you'll it, never have love as no, well. No, no, yeah. or men who go, you know, all well, women are ball breakers, they just want your money. I'm done with women. I couldn't go through that again. It would kill me if I had to lose half my property again. Right. The mind goes, that's my job. You see, we think our mind's job is to make us happy. It really isn't. It's to make us survive against what were once really pretty bad odds. And how we survive is every time we say something that would kill me, I'd die if that happened, the mind goes on red alert to stop it happening. In the same way, if you ate some mushrooms and were violently sick, you'll mm -hmm. find the minute you think, oh, no, no mushrooms again, or shellfish. And the next time you see shellfish, you go, oh, no, no, I couldn't eat that. Because your mind will always remember what hurts you, because its job is to keep you alive by making sure you don't get hurt. But it doesn't know what hurts you until you say, that last boyfriend broke my heart, shredded it to pieces and jumped on it. No, he just got bored with you. And you probably got bored with him. Or it wasn't the right fit or yeah. a number of things. Yeah. But, and everything he loved in you was still in you. He was just mm. your starter boyfriend. Maybe he was your starter husband, but he didn't kill you. But we tell ourselves all this crazy stuff and then wonder why we feel so crazy. When all we have to do is tell ourselves better stuff. My mum will kill me if I get my shoes dirty. My dad will kill me if I don't get all A's. My dad will go crazy if I come home with a bad report card, which is not true. But if you believe that, then you create a world of stress, mm. all because of what you say to yourself and tell yourself. Yeah. But that's actually very good news, because since you say it, you can say something say better. Say something else. You're yeah. in control. Yeah. yeah, always. What's the thing that you see the most that people struggle with? Is it um, a, a stress, an overwhelm, an anxiousness, a fear of it's, something? It's always a belief, I'm not enough. That's the biggest thing. In fact, I always say to all my clients, there's only three things wrong with everyone. Everyone has got three things wrong. The number one is I'm not enough. The second one is I'm different, so I can't connect. And the third is I really want something like freedom from depression or success, but it's not available. But I'm not enough is the biggest. Mm. I mean, I've worked with hundreds of thousands of addicts. I've never found one ever that ever believed they're enough. And if we look at the key addictions, shopping, binging on food, binging on alcohol, binging sex, on drugs, porn. sex, sex especially, Ooh, porn, yeah. all of those things things come from a feeling of emptiness inside because we're taught, oh, you feel a feeling? Why don't you eat some donuts or go mm. onto eBay and buy, or Amazon or buy a something or, or have a drink and our feelings are the most real thing we have and we push them down. We find all this stuff to buy or eat or drink or 
take to keep us, like John Lennon said, comfortably numb. Mm. But then the feelings regroup and come back because they've always got a job to do. And I would say to my clients, look, you've got to feel the feeling until it no longer requires to be felt. You can't eat it or drink it or shop it away, but we're all taught that we can and should. So I'm not yeah. enough is the biggest problem I see. I mean, if you look at Amy Winehouse or George Michael or Whitney Houston or Philip Seymour Hoffman, immense talent, a gift, beauty. Why did they feel like they were enough though? What was, well, when the world says you are yeah, enough, yeah. I'm going to celebrate you, you're going to have yeah. everything you want, we're going to talk about you constantly, yeah. stroke your ego, yeah. pay you a ton of money, how come they still can't get over that they're not enough? That's a great question. There's a couple of things. First of all, if you're Amy Winehouse and someone says write a song and you write back to Black in five minutes, they give you eight million dollars. It's what I call the self-destructiveness of talent. I didn't earn that. It's a bit like a lottery winner. I didn't work for that, I've got to get rid of it. Mm. You know, lottery winners who haven't had money will almost always go bankrupt very quickly. Right. So if you didn't earn it, it the has guilt, no value. The guilt yeah. of not feeling like, well, I didn't yeah. work 10 years yeah. for this. Or, yeah. Even with guys, you know, guys like to pursue women, so they've earned them. If you just give it up to them immediately, they like it, but they don't want to see you again because you've taken away their desire to earn it. If your dad is an heir and gives you a ton of money to open a business, you won't respect it because you didn't earn it. So the first thing is, this came to me so easily, therefore it has no value at all. And that's a big thing with mm. rock stars and music stars who debase it. But the second thing is with many people like, for instance, George Michael and Whitney Houston always had to pretend they were straight. They have to live a lie from the very beginning. Mm. Michael Jackson had to pretend to him this lovely, God-fearing, wonderful Walton-type family, and we know that wasn't true. Amy had to pretend that she didn't mind at all that her dad left her mom when she was four, and she minded very much indeed. So when you fake it and fake it and fake it and fool the world, you can't fool yourself. Mm. And then you're, you're living a lie, and eventually it comes back and people like Whitney, who was just so talented, then use drugs to hide the pain because I can't now come out and say that I'm not straight and I'm portrayed as this Bible-bashing, God-fearing man, heterosexual man-loving girl, and that's not me. I'm a party animal. I like women. But she wasn't allowed to say that. Mm -hmm. Coming from the church and everything else. Coming from yeah. the church, and it's so unfair to do that to people because you make them pretend to be something else, which causes intense stress. And then when you're in intense stress, what do you do? You have to take drugs. I remember years ago, Carrie Fisher's mother saying that she would appear on screen with two baby diaper pins on her shirt. And she was America's golden girl, but her husband was cheating. She was a chronic bulimic all her life and hid that and mm. such a shame. You mentioned something about leaning into the feelings until if you no longer need to yeah. feel them or yeah. until they go away. Feel the feeling until it no longer requires to be felt. Mm. Why do we? Why should we do that? So give me an example of a okay. feeling. So let's imagine <clears throat> you, you and your ex-wife are not getting on, and you have a feeling of rage about the fact that she's trying to get your kid to call the new guy daddy, and she's blocking you out, and you feel so angry. You think, well, I mustn't feel angry, you know, she's doing it for the interest of my kid, or, and so I just drink the anger, and I drink the anger. And you see, with a feeling, it's the most real thing you have. A feeling is it's like a little thing. kid in yeah. a class going, notice me, I'm over <coughs> here. And if you don't, they get more and more out of control. And so when you don't mm. acknowledge your feelings, they regroup, and they regroup until they become outrage, rage coming out, and then suddenly, they go a bit crazy in the car park of a store or the line of a store because the mind says, I've got all this rage wants to come out. Someone just cut into the line, take it out on them. And it's so ineffective because I have something I call triple A, which is be aware of your feeling. Most people have no idea what they feel. They go, I shouldn't feel jealous. I shouldn't feel envious. I shouldn't be furious with this kid who's keeping me up all night. So they're not aware of it, they certainly can't accept it, and they never get to articulate it. But if you can say, 
you know, my wife's a good person, but actually I'm furious with what she's doing. It really hurts my feelings. That's why group therapy in places like <coughs> AA, the good thing is you yeah. get to say, sometimes I could quite cheerfully um, hurt my wife. I'm not going to, but I feel like, it. oh yeah, I feel like that too. Because when you can express your feeling, it goes away. Yeah. It goes away immediately. When but you when you communicate yeah. yeah, even to yourself. So if your mother-in-law is the absolute bitch from hell, <laughs> and you can't say, by the way, Dorothy, you are the most horrible mother-in-law in the world, but you just go and shut yourself in the bathroom, turn on the taps, flush it on it, and say, Dorothy is a really unpleasant mother-in-law. And one you of my feel better yeah, you feel so much better it, yeah. because you're not saying it to them. It's <clears> like feelings are like gas; they're in or they're out, and they hurt much more when you keep them in. And you want to let them out. Maybe gas, I mean, obviously, right in the middle of a meeting, but when you right. keep stuff in, it causes you pain. And one of my amazing therapists said, "My mother-in-law really was the mother-in-law from hell," and I could never say anything because my husband was the golden boy. But after I trained with her, I started to say, "You know, Brenda." You're a really unhappy person, and I know you're trying to hurt my feelings, but I just feel so bad. And Brenda finally said, well, you mm. know, I've been bulimic for 32 years. Nobody wow. knows. Could you help me? She completely transformed that woman in two sessions, never been bulimic since. Now she, she likes me more than her son now. Wow. I'm now the <clears throat> daughter-in-law from heaven. I've got a big halo. Wow. But when we keep everything in, it does so much damage. It's like with little kids, they get angry, and we shout at them. They go, oh... My anger can't, makes you angry, angry yeah. and I'm not allowed to be angry. I'm not allowed to say to something express hurt myself. me. Mm. And all psychiatrists will tell you that the, in, in, if you want to be sorted out, here's something you must do. Express your hurt as close to the event that hurt you happening as possible. You can't say to your dad, you know, 20 years I asked for a bike and you got me a skateboard. I didn't want that. They go, what? I worked mm -hmm. nights to buy you that bike. You can't get any resolution after 10 years or 20 years. Yeah. But when you can say to your friend, look, I love you, you're my friend, but it really hurt me when you didn't even turn up to my wedding and I still had to pay for all of that and you didn't call and it hurt me. I still love you, but you hurt my feelings. Then it's gone, but when you keep it in, it doesn't, when you say to the yeah. friend, you make me feel so angry, well, you make me feel angry. I didn't come to your wedding because your guest list that was extortionate asking for all this stuff. I mean, I'm not Bank of America and I didn't want to buy that stuff. But you can't get resolution. Yeah. But when you say, I was hurt when, or I felt hurt by, and you can say it to a wall, you can say it to a force, you can say it to a mirror. You can write it down. It's not could, yeah. for the other person. It's good to say it because mm. it's out then. And then it goes away. It's the most wonderful thing. It goes away. And then everything is so different. Yeah. It's interesting because over the last two years, specifically, it's been magnified with men in the mm. media who yeah. have created all these, you know, killings, shootings. Yeah, I know. Racial marches, political distress, mm. you know, domestic violence. All these things have been happening. Yeah. And it's been magnified over the last couple of years, right? With Me Too and Time's mm. Up and everything. And... As a society, when men are unable to express or communicate themselves, or they're going to be known as weak or soft or whatever the word is, it's it's hard for them to, to express themselves in any other way except for this blow up. Yeah, especially when you say this, like, stop acting like a girl. You're exactly. running like a girl. Exactly. You're acting like a girl. Don't be a wuss. Don't yeah. be this. Don't be... It's like yeah. less than their manhood or yeah, something. Yeah, of course. And there's no wonder why. If it's not acceptable for men to express themselves in this yeah. way... It's hard for them to just be stoic constantly. Yeah. I'm not like saying it's okay what they've done mm. to act out, but I think society in general needs to have a big group hug sure. and, and let it out yeah. in a way where it's more acceptable to express ourselves. And also, whenever anyone does anything wrong, we go, what's wrong with you? We should say, what happened to you? Mm. What happened to you? And they'll go, well, you know, my mom always said she didn't want a girl. Boy, she wanted a girl, and I've been brought up. I'll give you an example, I had a city trader as a client who really had problems trading. And his boss said, you know, he's the best trader, but he's so nervous. And when I worked with him, he was saying that when he was a kid, his parents had two girls and then him. And he would smash his tongue toys and they go, what's wrong with you? Look at your sisters just combing their doll's hair and they're so good and why are you so aggressive? And a four-year-old can't go, well, because I have something called testosterone right. and they don't. And I'm designed to run and jump and hunt and fish, and I've got to learn 
what to do with aggression. Smashing my cars together is good for me. He didn't, a four-year-old doesn't have anything because they live in the world of, yeah. yeah, they just live in a world of feeling, not logic. And he said, I never realized, I spent my whole life thinking something's wrong with me because my parents would say, everything comes in, what's wrong with you? Look how neat you says, they don't get peas on the floor when they eat. And he said, I heard it every day wow. until I formed a belief something's wrong with me. He didn't date women because he thought, well, I should be like one, but I want to be like a man. And that session totally turned him around. He said it was like he, someone had sprayed him with pheromones because he went out that night and women were attaching themselves <laughs> to him like a magnet. But he just got rid of the feeling of something's mm. wrong with me. Because most people do walk around going, something's wrong with me, I'm just majorly messed up. And you can't heal. And no one understands me, yeah. no one gets yeah. me. Yeah, and no I don't understand me. And if yeah. I don't understand me, how can you? And why should I even be here? Yeah, because you can't heal what you can't understand. And so all the treating the symptom is like putting a band-aid on an infection. It doesn't, when you understand it, you can totally change your perception mm. of what it is because events actually don't affect you, but the meaning you attach is and does. The story we tell ourselves the about the The story, event. and that's, I love that because when, when I just got all my Stevie Awards, it's like, oh, I feel like I've got an Oscar. And that's good because I take client stories and I give them a happy ending. Always give them a happy ending. But then you have to understand a bit more of psychology because humans are hardwired to recreate what they know. We like what's familiar, even if even that's if very, negative. even yeah. if it's very bad. If I've never had money and I win the lottery, I'm going to get rid of it. Or if I've never had love and you love me, I'm going to reject Sabotage, you because yeah. it's so unfamiliar. If I've had a dad who calls me an idiot and worthless. Guess what kind of guy I like? That's it, because when I meet them, I go, oh, I feel like I've known this guy my whole life. We just clicked. And then you think, oh my God, it's because he's my dad. But now I've been sleeping with him for six months. I don't know what to do with that now. Because we are wired to like what is familiar and to resist what's unfamiliar. And that's what kept us alive. When we lived in Ward City, we didn't go, I'm a bit bored with this group. I think I'll go outside the Ward City and find another tribe, because they might have killed you. Mm -hmm. So we have this wiring that says, run towards what's familiar and run away from what's unfamiliar. But the very good news <clears throat> is you can make anything familiar. familiar. And the most important thing to make familiar is praising yourself. That's, if you could just do that, that in itself would change How so? How your you entire life. How do you praise yourself? Well, you get out in the morning and go, I'm a good person. I have a skill. I have a talent. I have something to offer the world. I'm here for a reason. You look in the mirror and go, oh, there you are. You're a good person. You've got a good heart. You know, the, the most important way to answer that question is this. What did you always want your dad to tell you, even if you never had a dad? Mm -hmm. If you had a dad, a good dad, what would he have said? Mm -hmm. What would your mama said? What would a nice teacher have said to you? And it would be something like this. I'm proud of you. You're a good son. I'm so glad I'm your dad. How lucky I got to have you. And mm. a teacher would say, you're such a smart kid. What a joy it is to teach you because you're smart. And we all want to hear the same stuff. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're interesting. You're a great company. Nobody needs to hear I'm the best dentist in Beverly Hills because that doesn't mm. work. It's emotions, and many of my clients, their mother might be dead, but they're still trying to get her to approve of them. Wow. Dad's living in another country, but they're still working to make him like them. And you know, the most oh. important thing is you like you. So whatever you wanted to hear, say it to yourself, because your mind doesn't even know that it's coming. And also it doesn't care. Your mind doesn't care if what you tell it is right or wrong or true or false, or even if it's good or bad, it lets it in like chapstick on your lips. Your lips don't go, is this organic, fair trade? Mm. Just lets it in, it, it needs a bit of nourishment. And we need some nourishment, mm. and words are very nourishing. And there is actually nothing on the planet that will raise your self-esteem like praise, mm. but self-praise is better. Because if I be said to you, yeah. oh, I just adore you, you're amazing. By the way, you know, can you do this and this and this? I've manipulated you. But if I say it to myself, my mind knows there's no manipulation, and the mind likes repetition. And when you say it every day, your mind kind of goes, oh yeah, here you go again with that praise. You say it every day, must be true. 
and now it sinks in. The problem is if you criticize yourself every day, it says the that same thing. That sinks in as well, and that yeah. hurts you. It's interesting yeah. because, you know, the, the big talents that commit suicide or die, you know, mm. the, um, who's the comedian? Robin's. Robin Williams. Yeah, Robin Williams, yeah. Amy Winehouse, all these individuals who yeah. have the world praising them, yeah. but they weren't able to praise themselves. Yeah, they, and they matter. don't let it in. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter if everyone else mm. acknowledges you. Yeah. It does matter, but you have to be willing to acknowledge yeah. yourself as well, right? And the familiar, unfamiliar, if praise is unfamiliar, but criticism is familiar, and you say to someone like Robin Williams, oh my God, that last show was funny, he goes, didn't you notice? I, I, I've left out the best word. I fluffed a word. It wasn't as good as the one before. So if you're not used to praise, you'll reject it. And if you're used to criticism, you'll add it in. Because we do what's familiar. So if we say to someone, I love your book, they go, oh, actually, it's not that good. The, yeah. the other one is much, I love your top. Oh, I got it in a car boot sale. It's five years, I've got a hole in it. So if we haven't got praise, we actually reject it. And you just have to say to yourself, I'm going to make this familiar. I'm going to praise myself every day. It might feel weird, but I'll keep doing it. It's a bit like running. You know, running mm -hmm. isn't familiar, especially around Beverly Hills. But if you put your shoes on and go for a run on concrete, eventually it becomes familiar and then you like it. I mean, sticking a lens in your eye, that's the weirdest thing. Very unfamiliar. The first few times, like, oh my God, I'm coming <laughs> in my eye like that. And then after a while, you can do it almost you without thinking because you yeah. get used to it. You can make anything familiar or unfamiliar. And my advice to everyone is look at your bad habits and make them unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And look at what you want, especially praise and make it familiar more so because if you've got a startup or you're working for yourself, the days of a boss going, well done, good job, pat on the back are over. And you have a praise muscle and no one's going to build it up except for you. But if you build it up, it makes you bulletproof. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm so glad you're talking about this because we have a similar philosophy and, and a lot of people that come to me are afraid of certain things. Mm. And at an early age, I was afraid of a lot of things. Yeah. I was afraid to talk to girls. As a, you yeah. know, as a 12 year old, I was afraid of speaking in public. I was afraid of mm. dancing. I was afraid yeah. of all these things, right? And I got, I got so sick and tired of being afraid that I just said, mm -hmm. I'm going to give myself a challenge mm -hmm. every day. You know, when I had a, when I was afraid of girls, I was mm -hmm. like, every time I see a girl that gives me butterflies, I'm going to go up to them yeah. and start a conversation. And it's terrifying. And I'm sweating and I'm stumbling mm. over my words. And people rejected me the first few times, but I just kept doing it until yeah. a girl said, hi, yeah. nice to see you. And you get a little confidence sure. until, you know, by the end of the summer, mm. when I was a teenager, it was like, every girl was talking to me. Of course. And I tell people, you gotta embrace the fear until the fear mm. disappears. Yeah. And it's similar with the feelings. Like yeah. You gotta live in the feelings until what would you say? Feel the, Feel the feelings it no longer requires to be felt. That's right. Because what you're really describing so eloquently is you had a massive fear of rejection, mm -hmm. talking to girls, speaking in public, mm -hmm. asking... Um, Feeling enough. Yeah, someone yeah. asking to employ you or pay you. So we have a great fear of rejection, which is not surprising because when we're born, we, we're, we have two drivers, find connection, avoid rejection. After all, mm. if a mother rejects a child, if a lion rejects a cub, it's not going to be adopted, it will Kills die. It. Yeah. yeah. Or it just starves to death. And so we know innately that our survival on the planet is linked to not being rejected. And not that long ago, you would have died from rejection. You mm. know, in, in a thousand years ago, when they banished you outside the walls of the city, or you marooned a difficult sailor, or you cast someone out of the community, you, you pretty much died. There was nothing out there but purgatory. Hmm. So we have a wiring that says rejection will kill me. And that's why you had the fear. But when you can dialogue with the other girl, no, it feels like it will kill me. It mm -hmm. can't kill me because no girl can reject me unless I give her my permission. Right, give them my power. You can't yeah. reject me unless I agree with everything. I don't like you because you've got short hair. I don't like your shirt. I don't like you because you're white, not white at all. Short glasses, not. But when you say you can't reject me, I'm, I can't be rejected because the only person you can reject me is me. Mm -hmm. You can talk to girls realizing even if they say, no, you're not my type, I'm with someone, no thanks, or even, ooh, not no, they can only reject you if you let that in. And we look right. at someone like James Corden, who's certainly not gorgeous, but women love him because he's funny. So funny. So funny. Love and that guy. you know, 
we, we like warm people, you know, the, the, the packaging is all very nice. Well, as we'll have a great packaging, a great wrapper, and it all, but they're unhappy. And so our greatest fear is to be rejected. But the mm. truth is, in 2018, you could live in this apartment, have Amazon deliver your groceries, never see a soul, and you probably live until you're 106. Yeah. Wouldn't I advise it, but we don't die of rejection anymore, but we still feel like we will. And all schools should be teaching kids, you cannot be rejected. You can ask for a pay rise. You can ask for crowdfunding. You can go to someone and go, here's my idea. You can write a book, speak in public. Because I work with a lot of actors who say, I'm so scared of rejection. I'm like, well, how are you going to be an actor then? Yeah, because you're supposed to be rejected so all the time. So why don't you and I write books for everyone who loves it? There's going to be the odd person who goes, I hate this book and I hate that writer too. But we don't let it in. We mm -hmm. have to laugh about it. When you give a YouTube talk, I mean, I've got, one of my talks has got like three million views, and there's a few in there going, I hate her, stuck up English um, <clears throat> snob. But they don't know me, because that's not me at all. But I don't go, oh my God, I can never write another book. I can, I'm okay, because I don't let it in, because the only opinion that matters is my opinion. I know I'm not a stuck up English snob. So that can't hurt me. Because if it did, I wouldn't be sharing it with you. Right, yeah. So if everyone's giving you negative feedback or critical feedback on mm -hmm. who you are, your performance, yeah. your, your work, how does someone not let it affect them? How does someone say, okay, As it can't That's it such a great question. So if someone just comes in and goes, I hate that shirt, or that, that color is so not you, or you should never have cut your hair, or oh, you've got a bit heavy, mm -hmm. you just go, Thanks for sharing that. Just a really simple mm -hmm. thing which says, thank you for sharing your opinion, which I can choose to not let in. You don't have to do anything else. Right. When the minute you go, well, your shirt's pretty awful, or look at your hair, or calling me heavy, you look, you, you look anorexic, you've let it in. And now you're trying to retaliate. And it's like a game of tennis. If you put down your racket and walk off the court, you can't volley. So the first mm -hmm. thing to say is, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And it's very good for the little barbs we get from people, family, friends, sisters, cousins, exes. Right. Um, if someone is really mean and says, you know, I listened to your talk on YouTube, oh my God, you stank up the place, I was embarrassed for you, then you go back and you say, I missed that, could you repeat that for me, slowly? They were usually not bothered because they know that in you asking them to repeat it slowly, you're going to call them out on it. Mm. And they usually go, oh, me and my big mouth, I'm just having a bad, I didn't actually really watch it anyway, just ignore me. And if they do, you must not go after them and go, no, I want you to repeat it right now, say it to my face. Don't do that because a bit like a lion who bears the teeth, they're saying, back off and I don't want to attack you. When a lion bears its teeth, you don't go up to it, you walk away, it gives you a chance to retract. So saying, could you repeat that slowly, mm. is giving the person a chance to retract. They almost always do, but occasionally they'll come back and go, no, I just said you're so wooden as a speaker, it's an insult to wood. <laughs> and then you have your third reaction, which is, oh, are you trying to make me feel bad about myself? Amazing. Oh. They usually go, no, no, me. No, I thought I should tell you how bad you are, because you need to get help, or never speak in public again, or I mean, I had a nanny once who was so awful, I had to say to her, darling, you're wonderful, but you're not meant to be a nanny. And I didn't criticize her, I just advised her to go and do something else, and we're still friends. So sometimes people think that the criticism and the barbs and the humor are a good way to give you a message. So when you say you're trying to hurt my feelings, they often say no. When you're being bullied at school, if you say, they go, yeah, I really am, mm -hmm. I want to hurt your feelings. That's that? the point, dummy. <laughs> Why? Because it's a domination. Mm. Bullying is just dominating. It's a bit like a seesaw. The bully feels they're at the bottom and you're above them and they can only diminish you or embellish themselves to be above you on this little seesaw. Oh, so they feel inferior. Yeah, a bully bullies feels always inferior. feel inferior. So let's imagine you, you're poor, your dad drinks, you don't have any money and there's this kid with new trainers and a new backpack 
and they come up and say you're just a faggot or you're gay because they want they can't really embellish themselves so the next option is let me diminish you hmm. i mean you, the embellishment is that i'm you're the no one in my family has been divorced so when we fight it must be your fault i mean you're from divorced people or well i've got a degree and you haven't or i've already raised a kid and i've got no problem with those ones so this must be your fault hmm. so you can embellish yourself but if you can't you go into diminishment and so when, when, when someone says, yes, I am trying to hurt your feelings, you simply reply, well, it's not going to work because I'm not letting that in. And I was in my garden last week filming an anti-bullying program, which we're giving away to every school. And I had these kids and this little girl was saying, um, I'm not letting that in. That's not going to work. And I said, <laughs> how do you feel? She goes, I feel so good because he's not hurting my feelings. I'm not letting it in. He can't hurt me because I'm just saying I'm not going to let that in. And then when it was his turn, he said, I'm kind of running. I'm becoming demotivated to bully her. I'm totally demotivated. And I was enjoying it because he got to the horrible things. He said, I'm so demotivated. I'm running out of stuff to say because she just won't let it in. And then they switched and she said the same thing. What's the point? He's not letting it in. I just, just want to stop this now. Yeah. So that's the fourth option. Mm. Well, that won't work because I'm not letting it in. And the fifth um, stage is to say, particularly with adults, like a, if you have a bullying coworker, do you know, since we're sharing here, you do know, don't you, that people who are critical have so much criticism reserved for themselves, they actively dislike themselves. And you're actually showing me and the entire office that you really don't like yourself. By critiquing me. Yeah, by critiquing, you're reflection. just showing me. Yeah. yeah, critical people always have criticism reserved for themselves. They are full of self-criticism, but they reflect mm -hmm. it out. And superior people and happy people always praise and people who feel inadequate always criticize because mm. criticize withers you and praise builds you up. And if you can use those five techniques, thanks for sharing, could you repeat that? Are you trying to hurt my feelings? Won't work, I'm not letting it in. Since we're sharing, did you know what is running your critical behavior? You don't let it in. And being able to not let in criticism, that too will change your life. It, it makes you bulletproof. You can't stop people being mean and having a horrible day. And we now have trolling, which is becoming an mm. epidemic. So it's actually worse. Our kids used to get bullied at school and go home to a sanctuary. Now they're bullied online. Now everywhere. they're bullied online, on the phone. And it's, it never ends and they feel really attacked. And see, when you find trolls, they're usually really miserable and unhappy, but they love the power because they have no power. They live on their own or with their mum. They have no life. I mean, we had a terrible situation in England where somebody was trolling this person whose child had been kidnapped. And when they exposed her, she killed herself, oh, man. which was a terrible thing for her. But obviously her sense of shame that she was outed and to kill herself, but she must have felt terrible. I felt so sorry for her. But she was very vicious in her trolling, but that's a really unhappy person. She needed a lot of help. But when you can teach people to come back from criticism without fighting or going, well, I hate you too, or you are all shut up, or crying, when you can just teach them, look, I'm not letting it. It's like if I try to give you a gift, you go, no, I don't need that gift. I'm holding the gift. Mm. I can't give you something if you don't take it. Nice. I can't serve papers on you unless you accept them. I can't serve a volley to you unless you volley it back. So when you learn that people can try and give you anything, but if you don't accept it, you haven't let it in. And if you don't let it in, it can't hurt you. This it is just hurts the person <laughs> who's left holding it. Years ago, I used to, when I got early in my career, I would react to any negative comment that I got online, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it might be. Anything that was critical towards me, mm -hmm. it was like I had to defend myself. Sure. Well, you don't know this about Because you me. let it in. I let everything in. I let everything sure. control, consume me. Yeah. So I was driven to be perfect, to try to like never let anyone yeah. critique me. And then when they did, I was like, you don't know me, you don't know this. Mm. And I remember feeling so exhausted. Of course. Trying to reply and be defensive and whatever it may mm. be. And sometimes these arguments online, we go back and forth for days or weeks. I know. Just waiting and for And then you forget person. what you've even argued about and in the what, first place. And a, uh, a good coach of mine at one point, he saw me, this was years ago, saw me like, I'd gotten a lot better, but still five years ago, I like 
tried to defend myself with like a very positive response that was like, well, here's why I did this, this, and this, but nothing negative about mm. it, right? And he called me out. He said, listen, don't even respond like that. Just say yeah. thank you for the feedback, yeah. period. Thanks for sharing. Exactly what you said. Just like, thank you for the feedback mm. and let it go. Yeah. And really now I think about, you know, the biggest critics are the ones who aren't creating. If you're, yeah. you don't see an author, you never go on Amazon and leave a negative review for another author. No, I have you a know cushion. How much yeah, and it says there's never been a statue erected to a critic. And I gave it to one of my clients who's an actor. That's great. And it's such a great thing. There's never been a statue or a monument mm. erected to a critic. That's great. Yeah. We had a critic in London, a critique play critic, and he actually wrote a play, and it was absolutely hammered. And he went, I never realised what I was doing to people how much I hurt them when I reviewed them, thought it was funny to make a joke at their expense. Oh my God, this book should not be put down. Indeed, it should be thrown as far away from the unfortunate reader as possible. Wow. He wrote that and then people started to get you their put your own, own back. Book out, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The trouble with this wow. book is once you put it down, you simply can't pick it up again. That's funny, isn't it? But yeah. not for the person who wrote exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> Wow, this is fascinating. What do you what do you think is your greatest challenge that you face internally, personal challenge as someone who's helped thousands, tens of thousands of people personally oh my and understand challenge. all this stuff? Yeah, I, I suppose it's not a challenge to get more people to understand it because people need it. You know, we all need to be nourished. You know, we need inter we need nourishment. Our soul needs to be nourished. It's not about organic avocados from O1 Market. That's great. But we all need this emotional nourishment. So is it a challenge getting more people to accept it? I don't think it is, because everyone I see, go, oh my God, I love that. And some people go, you know, I, I listen to you, thought, oh, that's rubbish. But then I found myself going into the garage and saying nice stuff to myself. So maybe my only challenge, but even then it's not a challenge, is I would say half the medical profession love what I do and really go for it and go, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm using it with my own patients. And the other half go, this is all silly. You know, illness is caused by disease. Mm. That you can't talk yourself better. Talking to yourself doesn't make any difference. You can't possibly give birth just using positive affirmations. It's like if, if you had cancer and you had a very good oncologist, you might go, look, you know, the way you think, the way you eat, the way you act, the way you rest can all affect. And they go, nope, you got cancer, chemotherapy, there's nothing else that will work. And all that stuff is hocus pocus. Right. So that is a challenge, mm. but it's not so much because I find so many doctors love what I do and go, wow, you know, all these illnesses are autoimmune illnesses. Many years ago, there was a wonderful psychiatrist in London called Dr. Maudsley, and he had a great expression. It's always been my favorite, and it says, the feeling that cannot find its expression in tears may cause other organs to weep. So he knew wow. 100 years ago. That's beautiful. So beautiful and so true. The feeling that... Cannot so find its expression in tears will cause other organs to weep. So he's pain. sort of saying, yeah. if you don't feel the feeling, your, your body body's going to feel it. If you don't open your mouth and say, you hurt me, don't be surprised if you get a screaming, oh, I've got this screaming headache, I've got this angry red rash, I've got this thumping pain, and by the words they're using, angry, wow. screaming, they're saying, I have rage that can't come out. I'm not out. expressing it, but it's come, yeah. expressed through my yeah, body. Yeah, because the body is very clever at finding something. Mm. People, I worked with someone who couldn't walk, and all she was, I can't stand that. I can't stand my ex, I can't stand my life, I can't stand my kids, and you can't stand up. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Oh, wow. She had sort of phantom leg pains because she couldn't stand anything. Believe me, also, well, what makes me sick is my sister-in-law. Oh, I'm so sick of her. She just makes me sick. I vomit in my mouth every time I hear her voice, and then they wonder why they're bulimic. Right because our words really affect our reality, partly because, and it's such an easy thing to say, every word you say is a blueprint that your mind, body, and psyche are working to make your reality. So we, we, we make our thoughts, and our thoughts make us, then we go out into the world and we justify our thoughts every day. But we, our words are a blueprint, and when you know that, you think, well, I better, Pay attention to that blueprint. I better not say this kid is killing me. My job is making me want to die. 
I'm so stressed out by what? The queue mm. in Hughes Market. Mm. Well, go to Zimbabwe where there is no Hughes Market right. and there is no queue and there's no money to buy food. And then you can say you're stressed because your problem, the queue in Erewhon and the bill, is someone else's fantasy dream come yeah. true. You, this freeway is killing you. You have a car. You have a, you have a Look job at to go people to, on yeah. four buses. Yeah. I used to take my daughter to school and I remember one day thinking that, oh my God, this commute is hell. And I saw someone at a bus and thought, how lucky am I? I'm in my car. I've got the heating. Minutes, yeah. I've got a cup of tea. I've got an hour to the listen music. to something. I can talk yeah. to my kid. I keep saying I want an hour to myself. Well, here it is. And I learned to stop doing that. But when you say, how are you? Oh, nightmare. It is torture. What? The traffic. Yeah, the traffic, the queue. People keep ringing me. The phone ringing. It's torture. Well, maybe if it didn't ring, that might be worse. Worse. Some of my clients or models will say, my life is hell because people look at me. It's like, really? Well, one day they won't. And then you might miss it. Mm. Yeah, but I get on a plane and guys hit on me. It's a nightmare. Well, put on a baseball hat and glasses, read a book, yourself, yeah. then they'll leave you alone. But that's not a nightmare, it's just mildly inconvenient. <laughs> it's not hell, Right. it's not killing you, but we use these incredible words, this is torture, this is killing me, this is a, this is a disaster. What is, well I went to the bathroom and I forgot to pause my movie. Well, that's not a disaster, but when you use those words, because right. your mind can't differentiate, just to feel like it really is a disaster. Then on the flip side of this, the beautiful part, if we, you know, when we understand and appreciate that our thoughts become yeah, reality, our things, yeah. we can create the life of our dreams as well. Absolutely. We can start to manifest our thoughts by, by yeah. visualizing, by telling ourselves what we want, who we want to become, yeah. and taking those actions toward it. We can manifest our dreams. You really can. You can stop being ill. You can change the shape of your body. You can change, change your, your digestion. Yeah. You can have physical things. You can change the way you interact with your kids. The way they... So here's a good example. My kid is a nightmare. Change that to my child as age appropriate. Mm, there you go. That's it. This builder's going to go, oh my God, that's a disaster. But a good builder will go, it's a challenge. When you said talking to girls is terrifying, you just change that to, it's challenging. Yeah. But hey, there's hundreds of girls yeah. out there. It's a right. numbers game. One will say yes. Some will say hi. Yeah. And even if they say no, the only risk in life is not to take the risk. Uh -huh. That's the risk. If you don't, when you take the risk and it goes wrong, you learn something. It gives you feedback for yeah. how to show up differently sure. the next time. My girlfriend's a doctor of physical therapy, and when she works on people, she would agree with everything you're saying because people's bodies are so tight, yeah. not because of something they tore or something so sore, mm. but it's because they're holding on to something emotionally. Yeah, and course. she says once they start to talk, their bodies relax yeah. and the pain goes away. Yeah, like I know that All the pain where they true. can't lift their shoulder, they can't turn their neck, once mm. they let it out their feelings yeah. about their relationship or their insecurities or whatever it may be, yeah. that's when they have a pain-free body. Because yeah. the body keeps score. The Absolutely. body holds on to pain and stress and tension and grief. And we carry around all this stuff. And yet, we really don't have to if just more people knew, mm. even to say, I'm enough every day. Yeah. And to say, another of my favorite things to go is I'm choosing this and I'm choosing to feel great. I'm choosing to work on my website all weekend. I'm choosing to go to the gym. I don't love it, but I love having a six pack. I'm mm -hmm. choosing to say no to Krispy Kreme donuts and love yes them. to apples. Love Krispy Kremes. Do you? I could eat 12 of them mm -hmm. right now. Oh, it's so good. But I choose the yeah. healthy. Yeah, choose. <laughs> and, and if you say, I'm choosing to do this and choosing to feel great about it, your mm -hmm. mind has a very clear image. The way you feel about everything is down to two things, the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. There's nothing else. So if you choose to run, going, I'm running, so I'm raising money for charity, so I'm going to complete this run. Even though my feet hurt, my knee hurts because I'm going to raise money. But you could run going, oh, I hate this. It's, I could be at home watching Netflix, I haven't eaten, and now my knee hurts, and then you'll have to stop. So when you keep saying, I'm mm -hmm. choosing because, it. Because, yeah. yeah. So if you're an Olympic athlete, you would choose to get up at 4 a.m. and train. If you are a diabetic, you choose to put a needle in your arm. If you wear lenses, you choose to jab your finger in your eye. But you don't go, oh, I hate it. I don't, I can't accept it and yeah. I can't change it. And when you say I'm choosing to study, to work on, to go and talk to this girl I really like or to put good food in my body, 
and I'm choosing to feel great about that too. There is, there is no resistance. When you go, I want donuts and I can't have them, I've got to eat this freaking rabbit food. What your mind does is it increases the desire for donuts because you said, I want donuts, but yes. I can't have them. I want pizza, I'm eating kale. I can't have these, but I choose to yeah, do this because... I can eat pizza every day. When I'm 95, I'm going to knock myself yeah. out with pizza. But right now, I actually want to look really good in my mm. clothes, maybe out of them too. So I'll save the pizza when I'm 80 because that door is probably shut then yeah. anyway. Then you can have loads of pizza. Yeah, every day. But you have to reason with your mind and negotiate and your mind will always do what it thinks you want. That's its job. And what, if you could yeah. only tell your mind what you want using relevant, up-to-the-minute words, you'll get exactly what you want. What do you uh, struggle with telling your mind? Is there anything that you... Um, it took me a long time, time to tell my mind not to eat sugar. I still uh -huh. look at it and go, it looks so nice. That's me. But um, I still look at candy. The other day I was really tired and I went into a shop to get mm. a coffee and they had jars of jellies and I thought I could eat all of those. All of it. But I'm choosing not to. Uh. And I just had the coffee. So working out, you know, I, we're on a schedule, sometimes just finding the time to go to the gym or do yoga or making the time. Yeah, that's probably the only two, really eating healthy food all the time, even on a plane, even sometimes yeah. where there is no healthy food, then you've got to wait and choosing to make myself excellent when I don't want to. But other than that, nothing really, because I am i couldn't do what I do unless I was really good at dialoguing. With my, my mind is my best friend. It's my the best PA I've ever had, and it does what I want because I give it clear instructions. Mm. What do you say yourself on a daily basis? Is there like a process in the morning, afternoon, yeah. at night, or what would it be like? Actually, when I wake up, the first thing I would say is I love my life. I love my linen, and I love my cup of tea. I always wake up going, I love my life. And then when I make my go, I love this tea. Hmm. I love the coffee. I love the shower gel in my shower. Because I, I really believe that if you can make your mind get excited by little things, then big things every day is like Christmas and I think when you wake up you should go oh what have I got today oh a world of stress I've got this 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 so you should always wake up and go I love my life I'm alive in a free country I've got all this stuff to make tea and life is great so I do that mm -hmm. and the second thing I do is I tend to stay in bed and do all my emails because then I feel like I'm not working because I'm in bed, propped up, drinking my tea, and I get all of that relaxed. out of the way. Yes, yeah, very stressed. relaxed. It's more relaxed. Not stressed. I try not to have to rush to go to base, but sometimes I do. And um, I mean, I'm very lucky because I love what I do, and I do what I love. People say you work really hard. I go, I've never worked a day in my life. I don't know what that is. I don't have to go. Where's a w my life is a weekend. People say, oh, the weekend. I go, what's a weekend? I, know. I can I take try time days, off. Yeah. I mean, I love my job because I get to make such a difference. So I don't really have much to moan about. Maybe communicating with my daughter is sometimes a challenge because I'm so positive that she occasionally wants me to be super negative. Why is that? Well, I guess because you have to be the opposite of your parents. <laughs> so I do all these positive. She's an artist and she does lots of negative statements on her paintings, on her T-shirts because that's the deal, you've got to be the opposite of your parents. But I understand that. Mm. But she's great. But really, I don't have much to but complain you have, about. You have a positive conversation with yourself pretty much 24-7. Yeah. What about a nightly uh, routine? Do you have a, a thoughts that you say to yourself? Um, well, you see, for me, I really believe that first it's what you do and then it's who you are so first you're doing it and then it's who you are and it's it so who you, you are yeah. that it wouldn't occur to you to have to make yourself do it see i would never sit on the couch and go my, my case is lost i just know it it's all going to go wrong there's no cabs out there this is a horrible flight i now have a belief and it really excuse me that there's no such thing as being bored. If my flight is late, I mean, I just get on my laptop, on my phone. I mean, it's I have 24-hour entertainment empty yeah. out. My emails, look at something. The days of having to wait and being bored, even waiting in the car. My little phone is like everything, books, messages, videos. And so I love that. I don't really mind about missing stuff and being late anymore. In fact, when I was last landing here two weeks ago, I was hoping the pilot because I was so into this movie. So, no, it's, Hopefully, it's delayed. Yeah. It was delayed. They, <laughs> de when the pilot said we've got to go around, I was like, "Oh, that's so great! Yes. That's exactly how long is left of this movie." 
But I think it's important for people to understand that it isn't what you do. It's a bit like people who say I've done yoga every day and now it's just my soul. Like Meghan Markle said that yoga is in my soul. I don't do yoga. Yoga is part of my life. It's like you don't say I walk my dog. If you've had a dog for 20 you just get up, pick up the lead and it's, it's who you are, not what you do. And so for me it, it really isn't what I do because it's so a part of me and I like it and so I'm quite lucky that I'm pretty happy yeah. and positive but I really do love my life and that's a good thing. Was there ever something in the last 10 years that questioned everything that you've done or that questioned your ability to say I love my life, you know? Well, I, I did get you. very sick like a year ago and I mm. thought wow how could that happen you know I'm so happy and positive and eat well so I was a bit surprised when I got sick but then How I did thought, you get well, through that? The same thing, the mm. thinking, the belief. I decided <clears throat> I'd focus on massive healing. I kept telling my body that it was a cancer fighting machine. I was making all these NK killer cells. And I did actually go home the next day. I was on stage a week later. And my doctor was like, wow, you become the poster girl for just going on with your life. And now I look at one particular um, YouTube and think that's so bizarre. I had like major surgery just a week before that and you'd never know. But um, again, it, it's, the, it's a belief. I decided I do wellness. I said to the hospital, I, I need to go home. I went, and I went and I got into my own bed. I watched um, Ray Donovan. I thought, this is it. I'm doing wellness here. I'm not going to lie in that bed where they mm. keep trying to give you pills. Wow. And I didn't feel any pain at all because I just kept telling my body to heal itself. And mm. then later I thought, Maybe it's good I got that because I can help other people. And I go, look, you know, it, it, life throws stuff at you, but you get to choose how to deal with it. Yeah. And even then, I noticed that I was very positive because I, you know, I had actually got womb cancer. I thought, well, oh, stroke of luck to get womb cancer. I don't need a womb. It's done its job. I've had a great kid. I talked to my womb and said, thanks for giving me this great kid. But now I've got to get rid of you because mm. I've got to stay here and raise this great kid. Wow. And I thought, that's good. I mean, imagine if you get brain cancer or bone cancer. I felt very lucky. It was a disposable organ. They'd done a great job. I didn't need it. And so I think once you become like that, it's just who you are. So I never had, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Because I thought, no, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. All and perspective, yeah. It is all perspective. I mean, I still, you know, people would say to me, but I thought you were so healthy. How could you get that? As it turns out, I, I have some, that same gene that Angelina Jolie has. Mm. But, but then, of course, Bruce Lipton would tell you, you can turn off a gene. You can, you can mentally remove that gene. So even with adversity, because it's quite good in a way, because people think, oh, your life's just, you're like Pollyanna, just tripping along, having a wonderful life. That's not true. I've still had adversity. But... Uh, your mind will always kick in when it's well trained. Yeah. You go, this is a blip, just it's just a blip, just carry on. And That's so you've you got to train your mind like you train a horse. You know, I say your mind's like a Ferrari. And if you've never driven a Ferrari, it's going to go all over the place. But if you have Ferrari driving lessons, you're going to run that Ferrari. The Ferrari should not be running you. If you get on a horse, you've never ridden it, it's going to go everywhere. But if you have some horse riding skills, you say go there mm -hmm. and it goes. So I see my mind like a horse mm. and I am the rider, but I'm going to tell my mind where to go and it's going to do it. You're fascinating. I love this. And you've got a book uh, coming out right now called Hashtag I Am Enough. Uh, mark your mirror and change your life. Tell me a little bit about this. Well, that's been my life's work, mark your mirror and change your life. It was actually lipstick your mirror uh -huh. and change your life because I used to teach people to write on their mirror, I'm enough. Um, one of my graduates was saying that the removal man that was removing, I said, why have you got that on your mirror? And she told me, I need a session with you this week. And my plumber was saying, why have you got that on your mirror? And I said, well, you know, everybody wants to change the world, but that's a big ask. I want to change people mm. one soul at a time. And I'm enough changes people. People write to me and say, it's just three words, but oh my God, the difference it's made. And so I told my plumber and he came back and said, you know, I had this really nerdy, unhappy son. He's now still nerdy, but he's a happy nerd. Got a happy, nerdy girlfriend, he's a very happy, nerdy club. My wife, who was in the menopause, is so different because we've got it on the fridge, on the mirrors, and a lot of parents write to me and say, wow, I put that in my kids' 
bathroom and had them say it and they've just suddenly become bulletproof against being bullied mm. and so I've all, always been in love with the I'm enough because when you're a therapist you're always working with what lies beneath what lies beneath these people's problems it's always the same I don't feel smart enough rich enough good enough and when you say things like I'm a rock star my goes not really a rock star because come on you live in a shared apartment and you've got a car that's 11 years old. You shop in Target, that's not right, a rock star. Right. I'm a goddess, because you're not really a goddess, right. because you've got cellulite. But when you say I'm enough, huh. it's strength, is it simplicity, and it's honesty. Because you are enough. You're not your weight, your shape, your size, your bank account, your childhood. Your race, you're yeah. enough. And the thing is, when you say it, and really say it, speak it, and let it in, people pick up your enoughness and believe it. So within that book, you'll see that we get people to change their passwords so they contain I'm enough, obviously with some letters and numbers and squiggles, we can't all have I'm <coughs> enough, it'd be a hacker's dream come true. Mm -hmm. But you write it all over your mirrors. You put it on your fridge in fridge. You your put phone. it on your screen. You have your phone alerts go off twice a day. And when you type it out in your passwords, when you write it, read it, say it, think it, it goes in and does the most incredible mm. work because when you feel enough, you can talk to people. You don't risk rejection because you can't be rejected. You take risks. People say, but if I'm enough, don't just lie on the sofa and eat potato chips. No. When you know you're enough, you think, I'm enough, I'm going to build this um, company, get a raise, get a promotion, uh, release my book. Um, I'm going to invent this thing I've had in my head for years. I'm going to ask that girl or guy out. I'm going to stand up to my kid's teacher who I think is terrifying me because they're not terrifying. So I'm enough. Just open so many doors and makes mm. you like yourself because if you don't like yourself nothing counts nothing you have is enough and that's what's behind so many people we think of everything it becomes suicidal right but i'm enough it, it's strength is its simplicity but also it's absolute truthfulness because everyone's enough and the minute you know it the whole world knows it and they treat you differently you see we think i'll buy a porsche and then i'm going to say look i'm enough i've got a porsche Still not. I'll, I'll get an Armani jacket or I'll get um, breast implants or lip implants and then I'm saying I'm enough but we see lots of people who've got all of that and are desperately desperately unhappy because everything you want is because it might make you feel enough when you can feel enough without the stuff now you've won and then you'll get the stuff anyway mm -hmm. but you only get the stuff for because you want it not because you need it to, to feel, feel enough. enough. Yeah. So if someone said to me, I, I keep buying all these Joe Malone candles to feel enough, I'm like, but you've got 22. And if you've, they've worked, why would you need 26? You've got 18 pairs of shoes to feel enough. Do you think 19 is going to make any difference? Stuff can't make you feel enough. It's out there. Feeling enough is in here. And when you know you're enough, you can still love a pair of shoes. Believe me, I love a nice pair of shoes. But I never buy them to feel enough because I'm enough without them. Mm. Powerful. It's very powerful. It's amazing. Yeah, because it's true. And so they can get the book, hashtag I'm enough. Uh, you can go to your website and get it there, right? Yeah. Or Amazon. What's your website? You can go to marissapeer.com. We have lots of free stuff there. We have self-esteem uh, downloads and money downloads and relations. We give them all away. And you can buy I'm Enough, the book. There's also a program. You can also get it on Amazon. I'm Enough. And then you can start to hashtag and create the movement send me from all over the world what it is in your country mm. we get people sending us pictures of their kids doing paintings of i'm enough and writing it somewhere planting flowers in their garden that come up and spell out i'm enough so nice it's amazing and it sounds like you don't work with many clients today but how could people work with you or one of your students. Yeah, I work with clients if it's a very unusual or particularly deserving case. But but actually, I don't need to see clients anymore because I used to really know I had a gift for what I do. But the way I teach my method is something that you can replicate. And we have amazing therapists all over the world, many in Los Angeles mm. who are so good. I mean, 
getting phenomenal results with people with impetigo and vitiligo and uh, ringing in the ears, tinnitus, all kinds of stuff, depression, anxiety, insomnia. So if you want to have some amazing RTT therapy, and it is amazing, again, just go to marissapeer.com okay. or you can go to rapidtransformationaltherapy.com and you can find someone who will change your life in 90 minutes. It's a 90 minute session. Mm -hmm. Might be three sessions. Might if be you three had, sessions, if you had bipolar, years. oh no. Yeah. If you had bipolar or bulimia, three sessions. If you wow. have insomnia or nail biting or anxiety, one session. Wow. Yeah, it's because it's so powerful and it's permanent. And you get your own audio recording to re to wire mm. in the changes, and it is That's a revolutionary cool. therapy. But I'm so proud of it. But I learned it from my clients. You know, yeah. what I learned what worked with real clients in real time that created stunning turns. I thought, mm. oh, this works. I'll teach that to everyone else because it's always your clients that teach you everything. Right, you had if, to learn, and some yeah. things were, some things didn't. Yeah. Kept yeah, they would always say, oh my God, when you got me to. Um, praise myself or when you got me to not let it increase and when you got me to go back to my boyfriend to go that hurt my feelings wow somebody said to me you know that i'm enough those words got me to walk out of my marriage walk into a building ask for a job got the job walk back to my apartment ask the super if he'd rent me something else and took my kids away from a violent man and it was just wow. those words that got it all started <clears throat> and so amazing. people write to me and tell me that and it's really nice amazing um, I want to make sure people get the book, check out your site, you're on social media as well, Marissa yeah. Peer everywhere, yeah. I'm assuming. So I'm very lucky that my parents gave me such an unusual name, Marissa Peer, because on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, it's all Marissa Peer. I do have That's another nice. Twitter feed called I'm Always Enough, because we couldn't get the Ooh, I'm. I like that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. We'll make sure to follow you all of those places. Um, and YouTube, it's all Marissa Peer too. Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll link it all up as well. Thank you. This is a question I ask everyone at the end. It's called the three truths. Mm -hmm. So I want you to imagine you get to pick the day that it's your last day on earth. It okay. could be as far away as you want it to be. And you've achieved everything you want or you've created everything you want. All the books, the talks, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of therapists have taken your yeah. program. Whatever you want, you've created it. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your work with you mm -hmm. on this last day. Right. It's a celebration, you've got to take it with you. And all you get to do is write down on a piece of paper the three things you know to be true about all of your experiences. These three lessons okay. that then you would share with the world. Since there's nothing else that they have access to. Yeah. What would you say are your three truths? I think that would be you're always enough and never forget it. Because when you know it, the whole world knows it and the world will believe what you believe about you. I'd also say you make your beliefs, and then your beliefs make you, and then you go into the world mm -hmm. and it starts to mirror whatever you believe. So make your beliefs amazing. Make your beliefs good. Like if you believe that dogs bite you, you make that belief, and then you act badly around dogs, and then dogs pick up your anxiety and they do bite you, because you've made them nervous. Mm -hmm. If you believe dogs are wonderful and loyal and man's so go, oh, I love dogs. The dog will love you, because our beliefs, our thoughts become feelings and they resonate out from us and back to us events that always match up our thoughts and beliefs. And when you know that, all you have to do is change your thoughts and beliefs and make them positive. It's like there's not enough money. There's enough money for mm. everyone. There's more than enough. But your belief that, well, if I have more, you get less and spiritual shouldn't ask for money and it's arrogant and I'm not worth it. If you make that belief, that's your blueprint. Why don't you make a belief that if I have more money, other people get to benefit too? And there's more than enough for everyone. Because there really is. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Wow. And true. And true. If you believe it to be true. Yeah. You, you are what you believe. You believe it believe says that else. in the Bible, man is what he believes. But it doesn't say, well, so go ahead and make great beliefs then. And woman do. That should be the second thing. That should yes. be the second thing. So that's what I would say if I had one day left. You are what you believe and you get to choose whatever mm. you believe. I know what I'd say. You can choose whatever you wish, negative, positive. You get to choose. What you can't choose is what you do to your body and your health and your negative. You can't choose that. I could say I'm just a negative person but over here is a positive person. We all can choose to do that. But 
you can never choose how you ruin your health, defeat your immune system, paralyze your autoimmune system, affect your nervous system. What goes on in your body when you're negative is, is horrific because the body can't choose. It has to react to negative. You make cortisol, that's a stress hormone. That shuts down fertility. It lays down fat. Mm. So all the stuff you're doing when you're negative, giving yourself heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure, all because you're choosing to be negative when if you come over to the positive world, which is so much better, you have better health. You live longer. You yeah. look 20 years younger. That's a good thing too. Because yeah. all the stress leaves your face. So. You don't have to take laxatives and all those antacids and stuff that people take because of their thinking. Mm. This is amazing. I know my audience is going to love this. So I want to acknowledge you, Marissa, for, for teaching in such a way that is simple. Simple, Because yeah. I think a lot of people overcomplicate their feelings, oh, yeah. the pain, the traumas, the, their story, mm. and they feel like there's no way out. But by you simplifying things and creating a structure and a process that makes it okay for people to let go of these mm. things that they're holding on to. You're helping heal so many people. So I want to acknowledge you for the work you're Thank doing, you. the impact you're making, and uh, the human that you are. Yeah. I appreciate you. Well, it should be simple. If you've got a job yeah. and a home and a kid, that's enough work for the rest of your life. People it's don't want self-help. It's to say, you've got to read a book every day. You've got to write a thousand goals. You've got to write a mission statement. It's like, it should take three minutes. I'm enough takes 30 seconds. Mm but the results out of all proportions in the investment. And that's how it should be, little teeny adjustments and tweaks, but have massive, mm. phenomenal results. And that's what that book's all about. There's no work in it. It's amazing. Hashtag I am enough. Make sure you guys pick it up. One final question is what's your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness is do what you love and love what you do. Everyone has a gift and your gift tends to lie behind what you love. So find what you love and then you'll never work a day in your life. And this is what you do too, That's isn't it? it? You've is never it. worked a day in your life because you do what you love. Yeah. And Thank we could you. all do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been a Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank you.